Thank you very much indeed, Anne. First of all, can I be heard? Has the technology worked? Okay, thumbs up at the back there. Well, thank you very much indeed for the invitation and the welcome. It's so good to see so many of you turning out on what I would say from the UK is an uncomfortably warm night. Uh, so to be here, that is very encouraging. Uh, Life Together, Life for Others, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Wisdom for Ministry in a Post-Christian World. There was some uh, um, variation in the title, I think. Some versions put um, Bonhoeffer's Guidelines for Ministry in a Post-Christian World. I didn't want to uh, create false expectations that there be any definite prescriptions from Bonhoeffer for our situation today. I don't think we can do that. But I, I prefer to speak of Bonhoeffer's Wisdom, his basic orientation to understanding the Christian faith and life, and the ministry of the church in its widest sense. This day, uh, 4th of February, is a very fitting date on which to think about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, for it is his birthday. It is his 113th birthday today, or it would have been. It's not, however, his actual birth in 1906 that I suggest we first commemorate this evening, Rather, his 30th birthday party, 4th of February, 1936, in a village called Finkenwalde, close to the Baltic coast of northeast Germany. There, an old school was now home to an illegal underground seminary for training pastors for the Confessing Church. That is, that section of German Protestantism which was resisting the takeover of the church as an instrument of the Nazi state. <clears throat> the seminary had been formed the previous year, 1935, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, not yet 30 years old, had been appointed director. Life in such a seminary at such a grim time in Germany was obviously a serious affair. But it wasn't all work and no play. And on the lighter side, birthday celebrations were highlights. So it was on this particular evening, as the students and their director gathered around the fire for a time of music making, games and friendly chat. But the high point of this party came when one of the students, knowing that the director had many contacts abroad, thanks to his ecumenical activities, asked if as a birthday present for him, the seminary could make a visit to Denmark and Sweden, Sweden in particular, but to get to Sweden from Germany, you have to go through Denmark. The Lutheran Church of Sweden was taking a big interest in the church struggle then going on in Germany, and the idea was greeted with acclamation by the students, strongly supported by the director himself. And the visit lasting 10 days took place just a few weeks later in March that year. Now this birthday incident and its aftermath might seem rather trivial in the total context of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's career, which combined profound theological and ethical thinking, costly engagement in the church's witness in the Nazi state, and eventual involvement in the political conspiracy against Hitler, which led to his execution at Flossenburg concentration camp in April 1945, just before the Second World War ended. There are, however, two features of the story which point up essential features of how Bonhoeffer saw church. And these ran counter to certain strongly held notions of the time in Germany. First, the very informality of that birthday party and other like occasions at Finkenwalde signaled a rather unusual view of um, community in academic and clerical circles in Germany at the time. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was indeed officially designated director of the seminary, uh, entitled to be addressed as Herr Director. But from the outset, he insisted that on a par with all the other students, all the students, he be styled Bruder Bonhoeffer, Brother Bonhoeffer, along with Brother Beitger, Brother Schoenherr, and so on. Life at Finkenwalde really would be life together, not a hierarchy, but mutual. Second, for five years and more, Bonhoeffer had been deeply involved in the international peace movement of the churches. He passionately believed that the Church of Jesus Christ was inherently transnational. 
a sign and instrument of God's command of peace to all peoples. In backing and leading the seminary's visit to Denmark and Sweden, he knew what he was doing. He was cocking a snoop at the nationalism of the official Reich Church, which wanted to control all such contacts itself. The Reich Church, largely um, subservient to the Nazi regime, regarded international ecumenism as un-German, indeed anti-German, dangerous to German interests. When the foreign ministry of the official Reich Church found out about the visit, they were furious, especially as Bonhoeffer had secured an official invitation from the Swedish Archbishop. So Bonhoeffer was landed in some deep trouble from those quarters, incurring warnings that his influence was, quote, not conducive to German interests, and that he was liable to the accusation of being, quote, a pacifist and an enemy of the state. He probably took those as compliments for him. Um, Bonhoeffer's seminary at Finkenwalder was already arousing suspicions, even in some circles of the confessing church, which, which, which it was serving. It was rumored that life at Finkenwalder resembled a Catholic monastery rather than a Lutheran preacher's seminary, as well as rigorous lectures in theology and classes in pastoralia. There was a disciplined daily life of communal prayer and private meditation, and even, it was said, private confession of sins one to another. So what had led this brilliant young theologian to take charge of what, at first sight, was a most un-Lutheran experiment in training future pastors? In a nutshell, Bonhoeffer believed that German Protestantism no longer had any real understanding of what church was all about. No idea of church as a community of people. If you went to church, it was basically an individual affair of going to Sunday worship for your personally, personal weekly dose of spiritual uplift, with no sense of being brought into active relationship with the others who were involved. And this individualism was one of the fatally weak points uh, in face of Hitler's advent to power in 1933. But while Bonhoeffer, from the start, was deeply committed to the confessing church, he believed that resistance to the dark spell of Nazism required more than the finest theology or even the magnificent confession of faith set out in the famous Barman Theological Declaration of 1934. It needed, he believed, a renewal of community at the heart of the church's life to counter the appeal of the fake racist and nationalist militaristic community being promoted by Adolf Hitler. And it was required, something like this was required to stiffen the resolve of those who were being tempted to retreat even further into an individualist escapist piety. For this, the church needed adequately trained clergy and an essential part of their formation would be the experience of living together in shared learning and spiritual discipline. It needed, he dared to say, a new monasticism, not like the old, but adequate to the present challenges. Um, he had gained much experience while a pastor in England from 33 to 35 from the English theological colleges, Anglican, Methodist, and indeed Baptist as well. And uh, one of the things he brought from uh, England to Finkenwalder was the importance of ball games for uh, community building. Uh, more about that. I mean, uh, some of us here know the experience of that. Where's Ken Manley? Uh, he and I used to crouch behind the wicket. He, I'm keeping wicket and he at slip uh, at Regent's Park College. And, uh, oh, there's Sean, Sean Winter, yes. Um, this finger on this hand remembers Sean's bowling when I was keeping wicket. Uh, every seventh ball, like, a, like in waves, was very wild and uh, well remembered, yeah. Uh, Hence the Finkenwalder experiment, which lasted two years, during which time some 110 students passed through till it was closed down by the Gestapo in 1937. But the work managed to continue in an even more clandest clandestine way underground for three more years. Underlying all that Bonhoeffer was writing and teaching at Finkenwalder 
was not just a concern to meet the immediate needs of the hour in the church struggle, but a very definite theology of Christ and the church. He'd worked this out long before the Nazi period and the onset of the church struggle. Indeed, it hails from his doctoral thesis, which he completed in 1927, the outrageously young age of 21. The subject of his thesis was the church, and its title was the Latin term Sanctorum Communio, the communion of saints. In his phrase, the church, that is the community or congregation which listens to God's word, is Christ existing as community. Not just in community, but as community. God in Christ becomes knowable in the community of his people. Revelation lands here on earth in a flesh and blood community. Christ existing as community. And in saying this, he claims that the church community is much more than just a religious association, a society of people who happen to believe similar or the same things. It is in their life together, the body of Christ, as Paul states. It's members sharing in the life of Christ and therefore members of one another. It's not just a religious society. It's nothing less than the new humanity being created by Christ. God's new creation. A very high view of the church indeed. Now at this point we need to acquaint ourselves with a tiny little bit of German and a word which onwards from this early stage runs like a stream through all Bonhoeffer's thinking right to his last days in prison. It's a word which in Sanctorum Communio describes in Bonhoeffer's view how Christ founds the church and how the members of its church conduct themselves one towards another. And it is this German word, Stellvertretung. And if you don't like the German, well, try the, uh, un, uh, the uh, ungainly English translation in the most recent versions of uh, the Bonhoeffer works, Vicarious Representative Action. I'll leave you to choose which is easier to say. Earlier translations of Bonhoeffer translated this word as deputyship because it refers to someone who stands for another. If you go to a meeting when someone can't go and you say, say will you go in my place, you are their deputy. Um, and that does convey something of what Bonhoeffer is on about with Stelber Tretum. But the, uh, latest, the translators of the new English edition didn't think that was quite far enough. Most of them were American. I used to tease them by saying, well, of course, you Americans, you think of those Western movies, don't you, where someone with a star on his chest comes riding into town. That's uh, the deputy. Of the, uh, no, they didn't want to convey that. Um, no, Selvatretung means someone who is where someone takes on that own person's situation, goes through it, and represents that person before others in their need. Um, if I may be continuing in a slightly less than serious vein, uh, Margaret and I recall a somewhat scurrilous instance of a plea for stelvertrating the first time we came to Victoria in uh, 2006. We were in a cafe in Apollo Bay. And this chap came in and addressed the friends at large in the cafe by saying, um, I want someone who will... Um, take on my penalty points for my license. I've had a summons from the Melbourne police with a fine and points on my license for going through a red light in the city a few days ago. And he wanted someone who would uh, uh, stand in for him, claim that uh, he'd been driving the car and take the penalty points on his license. Now that's a perverse way of stelvertrating, but be warned, you, don't find, you won't find much stelvertrating in Apollo Bay. They didn't buy this at all. But there is something of that, you see. Someone who stands in for you, for the other, goes, stands in for another person in their predicament. And for Bonhoeffer, in very serious way now, Stelvertretung is most fully exemplified by Jesus Christ himself, who did take our place as sinners on the cross, and who always exists as the love shown in that Stelvertretung. And equally, says Bonhoeffer, it defines how members of the body of Christ are called and enabled to relate to one another. To be Christ to one another, as Martin Luther put it in his exposition 
of the letter to the Galatians in particular. So Bonhoeffer here at the moment is very, very evangelical. He takes this view of Jesus taking our place. The thing, though, is he immediately translates it into relational terms uh, for the way in which we participate in Christ and share in Stelvertretung for one another in the church. Now, he moved on from Sanctorum Communio, but as I hope to show, Stelvertretung remained a key concept for him marking the trajectory of his life and thought in a stream that acquired widening and deepening significance as it flowed onwards. The church is founded by and lives by Stelvertretung in its life together as a community of ministry. Um, two of Bonhoeffer's best known and best loved books hail from his time at Finkenwalder. Discipleship, known to most of us in English originally as Cost of Discipleship, but the original German title is simply Nachfolger, Following Discipleship. Um, this was probably the first book many of us read from Bonhoeffer. It's based mainly on his seminary lectures of the, on the Gospel accounts of the calling of the first disciples and the Sermon on the Mount and on the Apostle Paul's teaching on the church as the body of Christ. And some of Bonhoeffer's most memorable phrases are found in these pages. Cheap grace is the mortal enemy of our church. He begins the book in those terms. Our struggle today is for costly grace. The cross is laid upon every Christian. When Christ calls us, he bids us come and die. And Bonhoeffer relentlessly etches Christian life as pursuing the narrow way of a relationship focused exclusively on Jesus himself, come what may. And in the context of the time, this was, uh, the significance of this was, of course, very apparent when so many were tempted to follow the broad way, the populist way of easy conformity to the world and the powers that be. And its significance, therefore, is clear. <coughs> Life Together, by comparison, is a much shorter book, but no less challenging. And it's not surprising that the Finkenwalder experiment continues to inspire further ventures and thinking on Christian community today, including, as uh, we know, here in Australia, too. Um, for a, a recent study on uh, this by uh, a British Baptist, I would commend the recent study by Craig Gardner of the South Wales Baptist College uh, in the UK of both Bonhoeffer and the Iona commun community, which was founded by George MacLeod in Scotland. It's called Melodies of a New Monasticism, book published last year. Melodies of a New Monasticism. Surprises meet us almost every page turn in life together. If we expect eulogies on the wonder and beauty of Christian fellowship, we're often in for a rude shock. Indeed, several times Bonhoeffer seems to warn us off forming or joining a community, especially if we have romantic or idealistic notions about it. The sooner, he says, a community is disillusioned about itself, the better, whether in a seminary, a congregation, a household, or whatever. Because Christian community is not based on our visions, however pious or romantic as to what it should be, but on the uncomfortable reality of its members as all too human people living not by virtue but by the forgiveness of sins. And here he is putting flesh on Stelvertretung. Uh, he's a very practical book. Part of that life together, he says, is that of service, ministry to one another. And I say he's very practical. For example, it is a good idea that all members receive a definite task to perform for the community so that they may know in times of doubt that they too are not useless and incapable of doing anything. Every Christian community must know that not only do the weak need the strong, but also that the strong cannot exist without the weak. The elimination of the weak is the death of the community. Notice when Bonhoeffer is saying this and what was happening in Germany at the time, the elimination of the handicapped, the so-called defectives, and so on. It's 
it sounds very internal to the Christian community, but it's running counter to much of the culture of the time. The strong cannot exist without the weak. The elimination of the weak is the death of the community. Um, got to say about pastors. Pastors assume that everyone wants to hear them speak. But the ser first service one owes to others is the community in the community is that of listening. We should listen with the ears of God, she says, so that we can speak the word of God. Then there is the ministry of active helpfulness, even in minor external matters. Nobody is too good for the lowest service. Third and most important, there is the service of bearing with others. In accordance with Paul's injunction, bear one another's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Bearing and forbearing with other sins means the burden of suffering. The burden of human beings, he says, was even for God so heavy that God had to go to the cross, suffering under it. Hence, too, the service of hearing one another's confession and in all humility of speaking and hearing the word of God one with another. This view of community goes much further than conventional superficialities about fellowship. And as I've already indicated, one of his views on ministry are in marked contrast to the Nazified ethos of the Führer principle, leadership based solely on power and assertion of authority and the dubious adulation of mass popularity. Pastors are not called to cajole or manipulate people or force them into their own mold, but to let Christ be formed in a community. We find no expositions of management techniques in the church and all the accompanying jargon of secular corporate life and decision making, which some church circles are tempted to adopt, at the same time, ironically, as they're being questioned in corporate business life today. Still less does Bonhoeffer give house room to personality cults and the worst excesses of the celebrity culture. The community of faith, he says, does not need brilliant personalities but faithful servants of Jesus Christ and of one another. It does not lack the former, but the latter. And in Bonhoeffer, we find a repeated emphasis on a shared ministry. In his classes at Finkenwalter, he has some very interesting things to say about preaching uh, and evangelization. The how of evangelization, as a section of his homiletics lectures called, is a shared enterprise. The bringer of God's word should be not an individual, but a church community. That is, several people as a small church community, as a brotherhood living together under the word. Early Christian proclamation, he says, even that of Paul, who was called alone, was not solitary. How often is Paul and Timothy who are uh, address their, let their letters? To what extent, he says, does that also apply to the pastoral office? Namely, that the one-man system actually represents an accommodation to secular vocations. This core group should be a community of prayer with the pastor. It's thus a shared ministry. We hear some very pointed admonitions, including some almost amusing, but still very practical quotes. He says, being completely exhausted after a sermon is a bad sign. It derives from an improper disposition it's not the pastor who is to deplete himself in the pulpit, but rather God. But what about the world? Bonhoeffer's time at Finkenwalder and shortly afterwards might seem indeed to have been a monastic phase of his life, insulated from the world. And people sometimes contrast what he wrote in Discipleship and Life Together with what he went on to write in his wartime ethics and above all in his prison letters about faith's responsibility in the world and the worldliness of Christianity. And so it might seem, but uh, people who were in my class this morning must forgive me for repeating this, the discipleship book ends in a remarkable way. I reckon one of the most remarkable passages Bonhoeffer ever wrote and crucial for understanding the way his mind was moving, just as life was becoming more difficult for him under the increasingly oppressive grip of the regime, and just as 
Germany and much of Europe was becoming indeed less Christian, indeed post-Christian. He links the question of the incarnation of God in Christ, the incarnate Christ, with the needs of all humanity. He says, in Christ's incarnation, all of humanity regains the dignity of bearing the image of God. Whoever from now on attacks the least of the people attacks Christ, who took on human form and who in himself has restored the image of God for all who bear a human countenance. In community with the incarnate one, we are once again given our true humanity. With it, we are delivered from the individualism caused by sin and at the same time restored to the whole of humanity. Inasmuch as we participate in Christ, the incarnate one, we also have a part in all of humanity, which is born by him. Notice the language of bearing in him, bearing again. Since we know ourselves to be accepted and born within the humanity of Jesus, our new humanity now also consists in bearing the troubles and sins of all others. That's Stelvertretung, of course. The incarnate one transforms his disciples into brothers and sisters of all human <coughs> beings. The philanthropy, that's the word quoted by Paul in Titus, chapter 3, verse 4, the philanthropy of God that became evidence in the incarnation of Christ is the reason for Christians to love every human being on earth as a brother or sister. The form of the incarnate one transforms the church community into the body of Christ upon which all of humanity's sin and trouble fall and by which alone these troubles and sins are born. This is about the ministry of Stelva Tretung at a new level. Whenever I read that passage, I feel as if the whole of discipleship has been leading us along a very narrow defile, focused entirely on the way of Christ, leading us to the cross, on Christ and his way alone. Then all of a sudden, in this passage, this narrow defile or corridor on which we've been walking opens out into a panorama of the whole world. The Christ whom we've been following to the exclusion of all others turns out to be the one who identifies himself with all people in their suffering and need. And so our faith likewise is called to embrace all humanity without barriers and thereby we allow the image of God to be recreated in us. So Bonhoeffer is here taking up his early notion of the church being Christ existing as community and placing it in the wider context of that church being Christ as existing as community in Stelvertretung for the whole world. He's writing life together as a slogan for the whole world under Christ. He himself had in effect already pointed this out four years earlier in 1933 during the first Nazi persecution of the Jews in his paper, The Church and the Jewish Question. He stated, among other things, the church has an unconditional obligation toward the victims of any societal order, even if they do not belong to the Christian community. That precept is now grounded in his incarnational doctrine of Christ and human community in which Stelvertretung is central. This understanding of Jesus Christ as the supreme example of Stelvertretung is what accompanied um, Bonhoeffer into um, some very dark places uh, during the political conspiracy against Hitler. Now he was devoting his writing time to his ethics which were much occupied with the question of what it means to act responsibly in society. And reading between the lines in his unfinished ethics, which he was still writing when he was arrested in 1943, we can see how the context of resistance and conspiracy was pressing upon his mind. All the complexities and ambiguities of involvement in a plot which would eventually require an attempt at assassination of the head of state, and the outcome of which could not be wholly foreseen, brought him face to face with the question of responsibility and guilt and whether in such a situation of massive politicized evil manifest on the scale of the Holocaust, one could ever really be guilt-free. Bonhoeffer's guiding light here is again 
Jesus as the supreme embodiment of vicarious representative action. Responsible action, if it's motivated by love for real people, as Jesus was, will lead to solidarity with their guilt and indeed will be prepared to become guilty for their sake rather than preserve one's own supposed innocence. This is Stelva Tretung at its most profound and it accompanied Bonhoeffer, the conspirator, into some very dark places indeed. One of the greatest privileges that's come to me over the years of Bonhoeffer studies was to come to know well Bonhoeffer's great friend and biographer Eberhard Beitger and his wife Renata, the niece of Bonhoeffer. Beitger once told me of a winter's evening early in the war when he and Bonhoeffer were staying in the country home of Bonhoeffer's brother-in-law Hans von Donanyi, who was one of the masterminds on the civilian wing of the conspiracy. The three of them were talking by the fireside and Donani asked Dietrich, what about the saying of Jesus, whoever takes the sword will perish by the sword? Does that mean us? For we are taking up the sword. And Dietrich answered, yes, that's true. Uh, that word is still valid for us now. The time, this evil time, needs exactly those people who are prepared to do that and let Jesus' saying be true. We take the sword and are prepared to perish by it. Taking up guilt means accepting the consequences of it. Maybe, he said, God will save us, but... Then a long pause. First of all, you must be prepared to accept the consequences. That was indeed a dark place to be in. But as well as illuminating that extreme situation, Bonhoeffer uses Selva Tretung as a lens to view all human social relationships, whether in the family or the world of work or education or whatever, seeing them as reflecting in some way elements of vicarious representative action, the kind of action which was consummated by Christ. That's a sign for the lordship of Christ over all things and all people. Stelva Tretung therefore marks the trajectory which Bonhoeffer's thinking, and indeed so much of his activity, took onwards from his first years as a theologian. But what about his latest phase, his imprisonment in April 1943 to his execution at Flossenburg concentration camp two years later? Did Stelva Tretung really survive that time during which, especially from end of April 44, he penned to Eberhard Beitzger those startling letters exploring what a religionless Christianity in a world come of age might look like. A world in which we have to live as if God was not there. In those letters, Bonhoeffer described what he saw as a long historical process now nearing completion of the end of what he called religion. Religion for him means thinking of God as a being who is outside and beyond our life in this world, who is only called in to, from outside when our human powers fall short. Religion, he says, means thinking which is metaphysical, confining God to a realm outside this visible world of time and space, thinking which is individualistic, concerned with my salvation, thinking which sees that salvation only in a realm the other side of death. What survives as religion today is, in Bonhoeffer's mind, always something partial, a sacred sector of life, where it is our life as a whole which is claimed and transformed by God. Jesus calls us not to religion, but to life, says Bonhoeffer. And the God of that kind of religion he's been criticizing is in any way, is in any case, fading away from human life today. And it has very little to do with what the Bible calls God, whose kingdom is the transformation of this world into a community of righteousness and peace in God. Um, whatever we describe the world as, whether it's post-Christian or post-Christendom or whatever, Bonhoeffer would say it is not post-Christ. Bonhoeffer is emphatic about this, as any evangelist is. He's absolutely sure of it. That's the main thrust of these prison writings. Not so much what is happening to the world, but how and where Christ is in it as a transformative presence with us. The place where God is rediscovered, not as a remote being beyond this world or taking us out of this world, 
but the beyond in the midst, the truly transcendent one at the centre of life. As his fateful time in prison drew on in August 1944, he wrote an outline for a book which included these notes. Encounter with Jesus Christ. Experience that here is a reversal of all human existence in the very fact that Jesus is there for others. Jesus' being for others is the, is the experience of transcendence. Faith is participating in this being of Jesus. Our relationship to God is a new life in being there for others through participation in the being of Jesus. The transcendent is not the infinite, unattainable tasks, but the neighbour within reach in any given situation. Bonhoeffer is writing as enthusiastically as any evangelist here. And that leads to his, one of his most famous um, conclusions. The church is church only when it is there for others. The church must participate in the worldly tasks of life in the community, not dominating but helping and serving. It must tell people in every calling what a life with Christ is, what it means to be there for others. And this is Bonhoeffer's basic guideline or wisdom for ministry today, to take part in the transform transformative life of Christ in this world. And I suggest that while the term Stelvertretung does not occur explicitly in his prison letters, its meaning comes to full flower in, at this time. Where in a world as it is today, religion tends to flourish only as a tool for those who want to use it for their own purposes of power and prestige, divisively and destructively. And just how much the contrast is with Bonhoeffer's view, we see almost at the end of his long poem called The Death of Moses, among the many poems he wrote in prison, penned in September 1944, after the failure of the July 20th plot on Hitler's life, and aware what his own fate was now likely to be, he writes, to punish sin, God, to forgive you are moved. O oh God, this people have I truly loved, that I bore its shame and sacrifices and saw its salvation, that suffices. That is Stelvertretung, as Bonhoeffer, as it were, took on the situation of his Germany before God. That is the fundamental wisdom that Bonhoeffer sets out for ministry in our world, a ministry which serves the transformative growth of people becoming not religious but fully human after the manner of Jesus Christ to be there for others. And that, as for Bonhoeffer, it will lead us into, no doubt, strange places. It means nurturing church communities of persons who grow, in the words of the Apostle Paul, to maturity, not to childlike dependence on false dependence on the one they call God. To maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ, ready for all the responsibilities of Stelvertretung, life with and for others, with all its joys and risks, and especially in solidarity with those who suffer and are not reckoned to count in society. In 1939, at the start of the Second World War, one of Bonhoeffer's British friends, the Scottish lay theologian and ecumenist J.H. Oldham, launched his fortnightly Christian newsletter. It provided a means of information and sharing of views on how Christians and all concerned people could respond to face the dreadful realities of war and all the challenges it would bring. In the opening number of the newsletter, Oldham addressed the subject of fear. Very simply but strikingly, he said, our fear is not fear of death, but fear of life. Life means making decisions, shouldering responsibilities, taking risks, acting even when we can't be sure of the outcome. It's the way of faith, hope and love. It is Stelvertretung. It's a very worldly ministry, but doesn't conform to what either the powers that be or popular opinion expects or wants of religion. And we can list certain points at which it challenges our personal and cultural mores and our churchly assumptions too. Stelvertretung is not an idea, but an action, an intensely loving action, divine and human. Bonhoeffer emphatically warns in his prison writings against purely verbalizing the gospel of Christ. Words alone, he warns, however theological, religious or pious, no longer convey who Christ is today. 
The church's word, he says, gains weight and power, not through concepts, but by example. I like to collect illustrations of the very point Bonhoeffer makes. One example, in my mind, is the former BBC World Affairs editor, John Simpson, who spent many years knocking around the world, covering some of the most terrible scenes of conflict. 20 years ago, the only time I met him was in a Belgrade hotel breakfast bar during the NATO bombing of Belgrade. He tells how his own Christian faith, that he thought he had outgrown decades before, came alive again in South Africa through witnessing at first hand the ending of apartheid and the role of people like Desmond Tutu as agents of reconciliation. And contradicting our current cultural assumptions that life is about protecting yourself from whatever discomforts you, he writes in his memoir, what if the point of living isn't to be placid and happy and untouched by the world, but to be deeply, painfully sensitive to it, to see its cruelty and savagery for what they are, and accept all this as readily as we accept its beauty. To be touched by it, moved by it, hurt by it even, but not to be indifferent to it. I think that's a rather good expression of religion as Christianity, or, or better, Christ-full life. Stelbertretung involves a spirituality of movement. An essential part of life together, as taught by Bonhoeffer, is intercessory prayer. Intercession for us is apt to become a matter of simply... Um, ticking off the boxes or the names of people or situations we like to think about today. He himself interceded for people, many people, during his imprisonment. The verb intercede derives from two Latin words, inter, between, and cadere, to move. In intercessory prayer, we don't just remember or think about certain people or situations. We move ourselves in spirit to be where they are, Ponder what they're going through, try to identify with it, and then move again to God and face God with what we have taken upon ourselves. There's no more profound example of intercessory prayer than the long poem Bonhoeffer wrote in Tegel Prison called Night Voices in Tegel, where he makes his own what he imagines his fellow prisoners, who are mostly not political prisoners in Tegel, but um, mostly soldiers who've fallen foul of the military law and rules, what they're muttering in their uneasy sleep, sinners and sinned against, anxious, guilty, fearful of what awaits them. He becomes their fellow in that situation and suffering. The way of Selvatretung runs counter to every form of self-enclosed life which regards any claim of what is outside us as intrusive and a violation of our freedom. It's the curse particularly of our Western culture at the time, the fear of what is outside and strange and possibly disturbing. It challenges the self-drawn boundaries of communal identity that claim quasi-sacred significance. The supreme exemplar of Stelvertretum, Jesus Christ, took the place of all people before God and represented God to all people, the Jew and the Gentile alike, even to the cross. Stelvertretum, challenges all our tendencies to erect self-made barriers around ourselves. What is responsible action cannot be determined or limited by the boundaries of race, class, nation or gender. In our time, nationalism is rampant again and moreover co-opting religion into its armory as in Pre President Narendra Modi's India, Vladimir, P P Vladimir Putin's Russia, President Tayyip Erdogan's Turkey and Donald Trump's USA. And you yourselves may have comments to make on the Australian scene, I don't know. <laughs> what people glibly call patriotism is on the way to becoming a substitute religion for many people, uh, a defence against others. Bonhoeffer's theologically based critique of all forms of nationalism during the 1930s, his insistence that the ecumenical fellowship of Jesus Christ stands for a totally different order of human solidarity, needs to be revisited and claimed as an essential part of the church's ministry today. This belief never left Bonhoeffer. Among his last known words, the day before he was executed, was a message to his English friend, Bishop George Bell. Tell him that with him I believe in the reality of our international Christian fellowship, which rises above all national interests and conflicts, and that our victory is certain. On our planet today, it's the most naive truths which are the most important. Summed up by the poet W.H. Auden, we must love one another or die. 
Stellvertretung means calling government and all power and authority to account on behalf of those who they claim will benefit from policies for their good. It seeks responsible use of the God-given resources of science, technology, and all human wisdom. In our day, much more than in Bonhoeffer's day, we are coming to recognize that this includes representation on behalf of the whole created order of the earth, threatened by climate change and environmental degradation. It means continually asking, are we aware of the consequences for others of our decisions and actions? Who is likely to be hurt by our actions or non-actions? It means representing to the interests of the future. The question a responsible person asks, said Bonhoeffer, is not how can I get out of the mess we're in, but how will the coming generation live? What kind of Christ is it we want to be existing as our communities in church? The fake Christ whom we want to bolster our differences and sense of importance, or the Christ who calls us to share his costly intercession for each and for all? What kind of persons are we hoping to nurture through our worship and life together? Persons who want to be safely marked out by their virtue, or those who are joyously thankful for grace and so dare to eat with tax collectors and sinners and take risks for others? What kind of impact upon society do we want to make? To restore the old Christendom where church and state went hand in glove, or where institutional Christianity dominated everything? Or do we want to seek embodiments and encourage embodiments of vicarious representative action wherever and by whomever they can enhance justice and promote peace in the world. Whatever we call the world, post-Christian, post-religious, post-Christendom, post-colonial, it is still the world in which Christ comes to live fully and to bring life in its fullness by his vicarious representative action and calls us to be with him there. Stellvertretung remains and will ever be the way of Christ in the midst of the world and our way of ministry with him, the way to the truly fullness, fullness of human fullness of life. My American friend John Matthews, pastor in um, Minnesota, Lutheran pastor, sums up Bonhoeffer's wisdom for us better than anyone else I know. He says, in a world and church where pain and suffering are seen as God's curse or absence, the disciples of Jesus Christ are called to live in solidarity with those who suffer in the knowledge that God suffers and calls people to share in God's suffering. In a world and church where fear of God and anxiety for the future cause people to assume a position of immature dependence before the Almighty, Jesus Christ calls disciples to trust the love of God and accept the role of stewarding the world in a mature and interdependent matter. In the same world, that is Bonhoeffer's last view of the world, the execution yard at Flossenburg concentration camp. The temptation is always for us to try and locate God in a different world from that which we are actually experiencing. Rather like the Chinese emperor who grew so unpopular with his people that he asked his advisors to find a new people for him to rule over. <laughs> Ministry means sticking with this world where we are now, even the post-Christian world. Not the imagined world of yesterday, nor the dreamt of world of tomorrow, but this very same world where God often seems absent or forgotten, as the world where we find and serve Christ, the Stelvertreter. One time, when I was with Eberhard Beitgen in his study, I asked him where the original prison letters that he received from Bonhoeffer were now kept. Oh, he said, pointing to his desk, in here. Would you like to see any of them? I said, yes, please. Well, which one would you like to see? And I, without hesitation, I said, please, could I see the one he wrote on July the 21st, 1944, the dark day after the failure of the plot against Hitler. A moment later, it was in my hand. It felt almost like holding one of the original of Paul's epistles. Heute, it begins, today, today. In other words, this very fearful and fateful day, this dark and God-forsaken post-Christian day, he writes to his friend Eberhard, I want to send you a greeting. Then he goes on with this marvelous statement of faith in which he reviews his life now, surely with its end in sight. He said, I discovered and am still discovering to this day that one only learns to have faith by living 
in the full this worldliness of life, this worldliness of life. Living fully in the midst of life's tasks, successes and failures, experiences and perplexities, then one takes seriously not one's own sufferings, but rather the sufferings of God in the world. Then one stands awake with Christ in Gethsemane, and this is how one becomes a human being, a Christian. How should one become arrogant over successes or shaken by one's failures when one shares in God's sufferings in the life of the world? I discovered and am still discovering to this day. I wonder when he was writing those lines, did his mind go back to that birthday party at Fingenfalter eight years earlier? That birthday party was one point on his journey of discovery and we too are all invited to make that journey from where we are now. It's a journey to which we are called by Christ, not to religion, not to another world, but to life in all its dimensions, life with others, life for others, the love which is God. That, I think, is Bonhoeffer's basic wisdom for ministry today. Thank you. Uh,